Hey gang, welcome to Big Brother and the Hodling Company. It's a podcast about music and Web3 and trying to fend off Big Brother. I'm a Keegan Voice. Today I spoke with the music artist Excellencia. The Puerto Rican-born, Florida-based artist has been one of the best at marrying Web2 and Web3 opportunities. Or rather, ignoring the strange tendency that many have to keep them separate. His new album, El Niño Estrella, for instance, uses dynamic, non-fungible tokens, or NFTs, to creatively transform their appearance via external triggers, like when a track gets to 100,000 Spotify streams. We chatted about the album, about crate digging, about mind maps, and about the supreme importance of imagination. Hope you all enjoyed the conversation. Here we go. Hey, X, it's great to have you here. Thank you for having me, man. Nice to meet. Nice to finally connect. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, to start these things, I always like to start at the beginning and learn a bit about your story, where you grew up, and when your relationship with music started. I was born in Puerto Rico. I'm half Cuban, half Puerto Rican, Cuban from father's side and Puerto Rican from the mother's side. A lot of history there just because uh, my dad went through the Cuban revolution. So at the time... When he was 16, basically, it was like almost mandatory to go into the army and get sent overseas. So that was like, before that, a ton of stuff happened. But that was like the drawing line, right? That was like, this is it. We got to find a way to get out of here. And there was like a lottery system in Cuba to be able to leave the country. And so a lot of Cubans migrated to Miami, but there's a few that actually went to Puerto Rico. Still Caribbean, still an island, all that stuff, but it was still part of the U.S. So it was a good like alternative. But yeah. From there, man, I realized like growing up, I was really into like music. I was really into the arts and stuff like that, but I didn't really tap into it. It was just really natural intuition. And I remember like my relationship with music started at that around that time. But I remember I have a huge vinyl collection that Mm. was basically I inherited. And I remember seeing the vinyl records and the covers and thinking, what is this? What's the point? (laughs) Like, why is this so big? What does this do? (laughs) And I just found it so fascinating. And From there, I got into reading like liner notes and like lyrics on booklets and trying to figure out like, why is this repeated? And it was like the chorus, right? I didn't understand Mm. all that Mm. stuff. (laughs) That's, that was my intro to music in a way. And then I began songwriting and then just like notebooks and stuff like that in class, like not paying attention, just (laughs) writing lyrics and songs and stuff. And then transitioned into producing. And then that was like high school. And then we had a crew in high school and then we all did latin music and all of us went on to do great things now in (laughs) in the industry but yeah cool amazing thank you i'm curious to go back and learn a little bit more about this like all the vinyl that that you inherited first like how did you come to inherit all this vinyl and what are like three three of the albums that you remember most prominently yeah, so I'm looking at a few here and then behind me. Oh, nice. I know it's audio, but there's a few in there. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, man, it's an insane mix of, so you have soul, you have jazz, you have classical music. There's a lot of Cuban salsa. There's a lot of mm. Puerto Rican salsa. There's ballads and boleros from like different parts of the world, Brazilian music. It was just like an insane mix of music. I remember there being a thriller vinyl and I couldn't find it. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> find it when I got the packages sent. But yeah, it was sent over by my grandfather. And he was like, hey, you know, you're building out your studio and take the collection and grab that. I'm not a DJ or anything, but I just like collecting. I like sampling. There's some insane covers, man. Like I'm looking at one. It's a Santana one and it's like super psychedelic. It's super dope. I have that up there. I have a Nat King Cole one. Man, just a, a really great mix of, of music and history there. Cool. That I don't ever plan on giving away. <laughs> yeah, really important step. Yeah, and I feel all the context that you were describing, like reading the liner notes, appreciating the artwork is something that's really been abstracted away from the music experience by by streaming and just like this great flattening of music. I see Web3 and on-chain music as like another opportunity to contextualize music again. I would love to hear how, what first opened your eyes to Web3, these these tools, what was first really exciting to you? And when did you realize that you could apply it to the music you were making? Yeah, so going back to what you just said about, I have this theory where like a lot of the things that were lost in the streaming era are making a comeback. So chasing the algorithm, short songs, we got rid of interludes, we got rid of skit, skits, mm-hmm. context, like you said, descriptions and things. And that sort of 
is co- making a comeback and also maybe more world building, storytelling, conceptual mm-hmm. albums, but like from the independent side, right? Like we see it from the big guys, <laughs> right? Yeah. But yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. And so for me, my intro was I was building out a label in a publishing company for Latin music, like around 2016 or so. And I remember searching online and looking for like new models and new ideas, new things that I could apply that will help me stand out. What edge, what am I really doing here? Am I just another Mm -hmm. label? Am I just another publishing company? I had the edge that I was like tapping into Latin, but I was like, let me see what else is out there. And I remember coming across blockchain at the time, which like I knew about Bitcoin, but I didn't really know about blockchain. When I learned about the blockchain and I saw like the, I guess, idea behind using it for music, it was more about like supply chain management for music Mm -hmm. and how it could have disrupted that. And so that was super interesting because at the time I was really naive. I was like, oh, this would be cool. You build a record label on the blockchain and everything's transparent and the artist right. will trust you and you can attract the best talent in the world that way. I was just thinking about different and new ways. It wasn't really about tokenizing music. But yeah, after that, I saw, you know, I went through 2017, that cycle, that hype, all of that stuff. And then that's when I really started learning. It's like phases, right? That's when I started learning more about smart contracts. And then I started learning about decentralization as like a philosophy or whatever, and going through all of that. And then the financial side at the same time, everything's going parabolic. (laughs) Yeah. And then I saw 2018 artists like experimenting with crowdfunding on chain and badges and stuff like that on Ujo music and like like microtransactions, all these different things, man, just compounded into me, like really diving into the entirety of the space, like every area, every sector, like I'm deep down the rabbit hole type. (laughs) And uh, yeah, then I started experimenting post COVID basically, like right after as COVID was happening. Yeah. Yeah. I feel COVID was actually as bad as it was for a lot of things. It was helpful for this space because a lot of people had time in their hands to just be on their computers and (laughs) making, making things and experimenting with them. Yeah. I guess I'm curious to hear a little bit more about like how as you're going down the rabbit hole and experiencing these different phases, both as they apply to music and like the philosophy of decentralization and things like that, how, how you transitioned personally from thinking like about your music label and wanting to stand out and like where just like what happened over the next few years that took you into 2020, 21 with the pandemic to like really starting to experiment with it. Yeah. I think for me, it always starts like the most basic layer is being independent, not having to ask for permission, not having mm. to wait, all those things drove me into, let me just do what I can do and work with what I have. And as long as I retain ownership, as long as I'm like non-exclusively tied to companies and, and management and stuff like that, I can keep experimenting. And for me, it was like, I noticed the industry was saying, hey, drop a song every 30 to 60 days. And I was, I don't know if I want to do that. Like that, if that's what you guys are doing, how am I going to stand out? So I actually started dropping songs weekly. So I built a playlist on Spotify and that was basically the album title. And I started putting out a song every week for two, three months or so. So it had an ending, right? It had a beginning and an end. And that kind of changed my mindset. It it started getting me traction. It started getting me the streams, all that stuff, discovery. So that was another turning point was seeing like just innovating on like how to distribute music and how to tell my story. And like every song I attached a piece of context to it, I would do a video of explaining why I did the song. Then another one was a little more fun, but just tying context to it and just saying, Mm -hmm. Hey, yes, I'm doing this weekly, but it's, it was my decision. I wasn't like the industry was forcing me, which now everyone's dropping weekly is what they want you to do. (laughs) So it's it's funny because like I was doing that in 2017 and I was like, well, I think that was a good time to do it. Now it's hit or miss. Right. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I worked in live entertainment like 10 years. So I worked in a lot of venues and I mm. worked in an arena. So I, I was juggling my career while I was working those jobs. So like when COVID hit, I was like out of work. Mm, like right. I was one of the first. And yeah, just 2020, seeing the summer, I started, I locked in, made a lot of music. But then I started, okay, maybe now is a really good opportunity for me to do the things that I wanted to do 2018, which is like crowdfund or do things like that, but using on-chain and blockchain technology to do it. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, Blau, that same year, I think end of year 2020, he did his crowdfund. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, this is picking up steam now. Like maybe I should pursue what I wanted to do. And it actually took me a whole year to actually <laughs> go ahead and do my actual crowdfund. But prior to that, I started 
seeing platforms pop up like catalog and things like that. And I started minting my music and, you know, I went from there. I also launched my social token, which we had to sunset that because the platform shut down. So that was an example of semi-centralized, semi. So that was a learning experience. So yeah, I was just so super open to, as an independent artist, exploring different models and things to not rely on the traditional music industry. Yeah. Yeah, it's been so cool watching people experiment in the space where just like the immense kind of composability of it and the fact that you can create while transcending these, what would typically be a walled garden and yep. like use all these different platforms in different ways that nobody else is doing. And it's, it's really exciting. That's, Definitely. It's, it's really cool to watch. I'm curious, you mentioned catalog when you're talking about you know, these different projects that have been popping up. You recently set a bid price of 32 ETH. <laughs> a teaser in catalog i think like for if someone buys it they get like an executive producer role slash title um yeah and, exactly. and um and i would love to talk a little bit about what the thought process and strategy was behind doing for that sure. for those you know who are listening who don't know 32 ETH is a lot of money it's probably yes. I don't know, 40 grand, things like that, 50 grand? More right now. Yeah, it's 50 to 60 grand at the moment. So yeah, I would love to hear more about your thought process behind that decision. Yeah, so it was a few things. So I had the idea in mind for some time because I started working on the album early on and I had a ton of ideas as to what could I do to raise funds on chain in a non-traditional way, not an advanced type of deal. And like another thing that influenced this that I actually got interest, I actually had an offer on, an offer on the table and I was like, it just didn't feel right. So mm. that kind of motivated me to go through with the idea and follow through with it. And that was another reason why I did it. And so the idea is like, you know, using a one of one to certify the idea that if someone like bids on that or purchases it, they get the role of executive producer. And like I described it in the mirror article as I, I compared it to financing an independent film and, and grabbing financing for an independent album it feels the same i know that indie films though it's much much harder requires a lot more money a lot more people behind it versus right. music nowadays where, where you can semi streamline a lot of it and that was the idea it was like to raise funds in a non-traditional way to finance the album bring this person in as an executive producer and that because i already have the music and the plan and the vision it felt like something that I can share if someone like was interested and they can see, damn, he's not playing. Like he actually <laughs> has a plan, a vision. He has right. it mapped out in a way that like this could potentially make sense and work out for the bidder and myself. So yeah, it was like, it's a long shot in the dark, a hundred percent. But I thought about just, let me try something new on chain using a one of one. And because I had this membership pass that I also launched, that was like the follow up to that, which involves my collectors and my active community a lot more. So a lot of people probably saw the 32 ETH bid as me like canceling out a certain like group of people, hmm. but it's a different approach to trying to raise funds versus the membership pass using an open edition model for it. Totally. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I like that comparison to, to an independent film. It's, it's less of a crowd fund of going after trying to get a little bit of money from a lot of people and acknowledging this type of role, like a producer role is very important, yeah. basically in all creative projects. Yeah, that's a cool experiment. I, I checked and no one has yet purchased it, right? No, no, no one has purchased it. And it's funny you're asking because I actually threw my original mirror article. I threw it into GPT and I asked it like to break it down and what does it think about it? Huh. And, or like the same question you asked me, it's what I asked GPT. And then I grabbed right. that and I posted it on mirror as well. <laughs> so that's live as well. So it's challenging my thinking around the model and seeing if I was too crazy or not too delusional. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a fun experiment too. And it actually broke it down like pretty damn well. It was pretty interesting. Huh. Man, I should do that with. Most things in my life, probably. Yeah, just, no, I think it's great. <laughs> just in case. Keep myself honest. <laughs> See if our AI gods have something to say about what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love to talk a little bit more about speaking of worlds and all of all of that. Like it's what you're building with El Nino Estre is is really cool in terms of like using dynamic NFTs that evolve throughout the journey. And and we, one of the things I loved in the mirror article that you wrote about it was it also <laughs> touches on what we were talking about earlier but like you wrote as a kid it felt that i had the biggest imagination and we tend yeah. to lose that sense of wonder as we grow older 
which kind of riffs back on how we started this conversation about we need context and we need other components to round out the worlds that we want to build as yeah. artists. So anyways, I wanted to make sure I created space for you to chat about the various mechanics that, that you're utilizing with this album and talk about that a bit, but also love to dive into, I guess, the concept of imagination a bit more. Yeah, as no, well. <laughs> love that, love that. Man, it was like, it was a long time coming. I dropped an EP in 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. It was called, well, which is The Boy Who Cried Wolf. And the illustrator, the artist behind that, he made this amazing piece. I have a canvas of it. It was a good project for me. It did really well. And I don't know why a couple of years passed. And last year, when I started thinking about what should I do next? Should I do an album? Should I do EP? Just struggling with that or like single by single. And I, it's a derivative of that. It's like a Nino Estrella. So it's a serious of, or, of sorts. It's like starting anew, but it's a serious. And yeah, I thought about like bringing that to life again, but maybe starting it on chain and using the on chain tools and things to bring it to life. But I fell in love with this concept of instead of following your dreams, follow your imagination. Mm -hmm. And so that started, it all came coming together, connecting the dots. Another thing, the music that I started making, I usually, my process is very like spontaneous and I'll go in and I'll just throw a bunch of ideas down and I have pretty good production selection and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I took a step back and I said, what am I really into? What do I really like? What are my real influences? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people will tell you like, you should try to innovate or you should try to do this and step away from your comfort zone. But I was like, this time I want to keep the essence mm -hmm. and, and find those three styles of music, let's say that I absolutely resonate with and I'm influenced mm -hmm. by and, and I started making the music. So that started feeling like I was using my imagination and like I was trusting my sort of my vision as an artist and the music that I was making just felt really natural and felt very me. Mm -hmm. And that also inspired the album. So it's like connecting a lot of dots, putting it all together to bring this project to life. That's really what inspired it all. Yeah, totally. That's really cool. What were some of the things that, that you uncovered? I think you mentioned there were three things like what were some of the things that you uncovered when you tried to dive into your imagination and be like okay what is at the root of me what is most important yeah yeah it's interesting because it was like I started actually like taking notes down as I was like recording and I think even prior to that which I never really do mm. so I dived in and I was like I even made a checklist I was like after I'm done making all of this music I'm gonna go through this checklist and see if like the music, like I had like relatability. I had, man, it was a couple of things. Like, will people dance to it? Will people fall mm. in love to it? Will people it's just storytelling? Am I telling my story? Am I doing this? I don't know why I wanted to challenge myself into that. The music checks off all the lists for me. And for a while now, man, I feel like one thing about Latin music is that it's very versatile, very like we fuse a lot of styles, right? And that's just a natural thing. So a lot of my music um, feels like that. I'm in a way all over the place, but not really. <laughs> mm. But it's just been a thing of Latin music for a long time. And like, those were things I started checking off. And as the three things, it was more of the, uh, the actual like style of music. So I was mm. like, I'm heavily influenced by hip hop. So why am I not doing more hip hop, but in my style? Right. So I did that. Right. Reggaeton is keeping the essence, but maybe innovating a bit on the sound and switching it up. And I think the other style was more like global music, world music that can connect and with people anywhere they are in the world. And I made music based on those three concepts. And then I had that sort of checklist of ideas and concepts and feelings. And I was like, this is feeling special now. <laughs> I love that. It feels like a great exercise where you can give some structure of like your own being and your own imagination to something. And then you can let your skills and your expertise as a music maker just filter through this like map that, that you've created. Yeah, exactly. Mind map. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that, that, that in the FAQ on the project, it yeah, says yeah. roadmap question mark. And you wrote, I preferred mind map. Yeah, for sure. You tell me why. <laughs> yeah, it was just like, I've been just, again, back to the imagination thing. Like I'm following yeah. my imagination more so than a roadmap. <laughs> and yeah, I am. A, I'm actually a really organized person. I love planning things. I like, mm -hmm. I enjoy that. But I was like, in this case, let me just, I think it was learning experiences. It was like over time, like why pack so much utility rewards and experiences from the get where it's something where the reality is that over time, 
I may wake up and say, damn, I want to do a random live stream or I want to do a giveaway today. I don't want to limit myself. Life is dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> like again, that goes back to the past, right? Yeah. All of that stuff kind of ties in together. Totally. Life is dynamic. Yeah. And I think you alluded to something that I think is, has been like really, is really important. It's been one of my observations in the Web3 music space is there's so much attention given to the utility and the mechanics of something that so often we're not talking so much about the music itself. It's, I'm curious if you have this take as well that like Web3 music almost is categorized as its own genre, even though it's, it contains like every type of music, which has been really strange for me. I was a music journalist covering scenes and different types of music before I ever got into the blockchain. I'm just curious to hear your perspective on what how that feels to you. Yeah, I think, I think that's super interesting because I remember very early on, everyone was saying, there's no culture here. There's no community. There's, it, this is not a scene. This is a technology. And it just threw me off because I'm like, it feels like the opposite. It feels like there are scenes and there are communities and there are groups of people, like-minded individuals where like, mm. I felt very early on, like, even though we're all different and unique in our own right, we have a lot of relatable stories. That's why kind of we're all here, right? Like we, mm. we saw something. Um, right. So I never really agreed to that. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see a few years out if this influences our music in a way. I, I'm not too sure. I think the more on chain you are possibly because you're experimenting maybe more so with like generative music stuff and like, that can definitely change things or AI stuff, different convo. But yeah, maybe that would categorize it in its own genre. But that's a super interesting thought. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's so strange to me that all of the attention to music in, in the legacy space is about, you know, let's just say pre-Web3 space, is about the music itself, yeah. aside from the tech journals and stuff that exist out there, whereas almost all of the media attention given to music in Web3 is to the mechanics and utility of it. And sales. <laughs> and sales, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Another interesting one. <laughs> yeah, let's dive into that a little bit, actually. <laughs> yeah. Do you... I, I had this thought a few times, I guess, but last week, and I was like, like fans or like supporters, like, like they don't care about the deal terms of their favorite artists, right? right. They don't care right. that artist took an advance, how many albums is per term and like their sales figures, unless they pop up on Forbes or something like that. Yeah. So I think pushing this narrative and this idea that sales will get us mass adoption or something like I'm not seeing it mm -hmm. mostly because if we're talking mass adoption then we're assuming it's like fans that have no exposure to the space and like, they don't really care about sales. Yeah. You're going to, that's an industry figure, a figure that the headlines and the, maybe the labels and the managers and stuff like. But fans themselves, I don't think so. Will, will it attract artists? I think so. And then maybe they bring in their audience or something, but right. uh, I'm not sure if that's like the strategy. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. Because when an artist signs in the real world, they don't announce the figure most yeah. of the time. They'll yeah. just show the picture in the office. I just yeah. signed the deal. <laughs> yeah. And people are excited and stuff, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And yeah, that's a great comparison. It, it does feel a bit, a bit over-financialized in, in uh, and maybe like I totally understand why, because m music is, is so under financialized now when it comes to like how artists make money and more people should know about why artists do not make money. It, but it does, I feel like that narrative will only get you so far. It's interesting because it feels like it's tapped into this sort of other group of people who are collectors and like maybe a bit coming more from like the DeFi world than like the music world. Yeah, But with this narrative, it feels like it's going to be tough to tap into like the Spotify world, the people right. who want to listen to music, but do so in a convenient way where that's, it's about the music. Yeah. I was reading a, an article about online music, like the early days and mm. at the end of, of the, it was like the MP3 online music and like the entire timeline. And at the very end, it said at the end, convenience won. And I think that like history kind of rhymes right and so we'll probably see something like that where convenience will be the it factor if we're right. talking mass right a lot of people are happy with the scenes the communities like the niche stuff and i think that's great as well i, I don't think that's ever 
disappeared from music, right? We, people call it underground or whatever. And so I, I don't see anything wrong with people that don't want or are not interested in like mass adoption or going mainstream and stuff like that. I think that's actually healthy and sustainable. And that's coming from someone that's into the financial side of things. And then I'm intro, I have friends in the mainstream, so I'm learning from that world and like just learning from the top and from the bottom and everywhere to help my thinking and process and stuff. But yeah, definitely interested in seeing where we go over the next few years. Yeah, totally. I feel like the return to context is, it's, is really, really powerful. And I, I think a bit more adoption from the artist side and like more experimentation in that side could go a long way. Coming back to the same reason, like you collect vinyl, I collect vinyl. We, we still right. like the idea of crate digging. There's whether it's like the tactile sensation of holding a physical object or having the context there, you know, the line, like the notes, the lyrics, the artwork. And it'll be interesting. I wonder if, to me, it feels like so many people are trying to lean into, we have to scale Web3 so it replaces Web2. But it, it can't it also exist as like this underground thing, as you're saying, this like niche yeah. offering that can act as, as like a supplement to Web2, or like you can bring in, you can bring in the people who want to engage a bit more and the people who don't just like, Stay on Spotify because, you know, as you're saying, I think convenience, unfortunately, will ultimately win. Yeah. You don't want to reject your supporters, right? Like you don't yeah. want to say, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. It goes back to, this is probably already overused, but this idea of like web two for audience discovery, reach web three is more for like your super fan base, your super fan community when experimenting with new models and things that could be done at the, like the, at the, a more intimate level right. on, on all sides of it. And then you can still go out there and bring your music to the world. Like, I don't think that music going digital, it didn't replace artists going out there and doing shows or like stuff like that. So that's what I would compare it to. I think it can run in parallel. If for a while we were using streams as an anchor, but it was really not that I agree with the economics of it all, but I think it was more like the major label structure and deals and things that were like affecting artists more than anything. And it's like people were talking numbers and these other things, but there's other things like song lock-ins and commitments, and they only drop stuff that's satisfactory according to them. And these weird things no one in Web3 music talks about, but it'll just use the streaming thing to anchor it. And it's, I think music is too horizontal for people to limit themselves. And we're seeing artists come back to, hey, I'm on Spotify now. Hey, the project is finally going to come out on DSPs. And it, it takes me back to some research I read about the hierarchy of needs for artists and creators. Mm -hmm. And it said how, like, it's less interesting now to identify with wanting to sign to a label and not, they're not chasing money. They're actually chasing like discovery, like right. most artists. Yeah. So they're going to go to where yeah. yeah, exactly. So that was a really interesting piece and in the way they broke it down and it helped my thinking of that's what's happening, right? If artists don't see traction or sales or anything, they're going to go to where they can potentially get discovery reach and then tr hopefully translate that into opportunities that brings them the money to live off of and build their projects. Totally. For an artist that's just starting out, let's say they don't have an audience in Web 2 or Web 3, and they're young and they want to start putting their music somewhere, they have music, and they just are ready to move it from here to, to there. Yeah. What, would, what are like three pieces of advice that, that you would give that person? I think out the gate, really organize like your structure and have that, get the boring stuff out of the way first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then you can focus on creation and right. you're not stressed. Like you can streamline your creation. I think that would be like number one. I think number two is not limiting yourself to experimenting, exploring different platforms, models, and things like that. Because I've always been platform agnostic and like mm -hmm. as an independent, that's, I realized that was the way to move. For example, I'm like, I, I work with a few distributors, but I'm not exclusively tied to any of them. So I think that helps me a lot because now I can, I can, if I want to distro with this one that focuses on Latin, I can do that. If I have a collaboration with an electronic producer, then we can go with this route. You know what I mean? So open yourself up to that. And yeah, I think third is just be patient. Like, <laughs> like I always say that it's easier said than done, but yeah, definitely. I had a, Twitter space. And I said something along the lines of my best moments come after my longest or best breaks. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good piece of advice. It's like not to let 
external influences or things shape your vision or your path. It's hard. It's definitely hard. But I remember disconnecting for a long time and it was the best thing I did. It's mm. like kind of cliche, but it works. And yeah, definitely take those breaks, those rests. The best do it, right? You look at the greatest athletes. They're not playing every single day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're not like practicing every day. They have those rests and those breaks uh, to improve. That's part of the improvement and the journey. Totally. Yeah, arguably nothing is as important just aside from like the work, it, like the actual creation itself, taking moments to rest, reflect, to allow your body to heal, yeah. your mind you gotta live. to heal, <laughs> to live. Yeah, you, live. you gotta live. It's so important to leave the productive mind from time to time and just let things sit. So I think you're right. That's when like the true magic starts to bubble up. 100%. What, what was that magic for you? What, what bubbled up when you took a break? Man, just it's even crazy I'm saying this, but because I have issues like sleeping, for example, because mm. my mind is always on 24 yeah. 7. I'm always like, I have that kind of energy. And so, but I do know the importance in like taking breaks and rest. And it's funny because it's like when I do that, my best ideas come, right? Mm -hmm. The creativity actually jump starts and it's like epiphanies, right? But you can't have that if you're always productive and you're always yeah. doing shit. Like you'll get work done. And all that, but you got to zoom out, <laughs> you got to <laughs> step back. And those moments give you the epiphany to, yeah. One of the epiphanies I had was like working with what I have. Mm. And that changed a lot for me. It was like, if I, I need to work with what I have and not wait for X, Y, Z, that will get me to there, to X, Y, Z. So it's a struggle, but yeah, I've had a few big moments and epiphanies that kind of shaped who I am today and for my music stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It all goes back to back to imagination. You got to leave. Yeah. If you don't leave space for imagination, there's not going to be any imagination. Exactly. Like, exactly. Like, imagine to imagine is like its own pursuit and its own time. Like it, it requires its own time to actually Absolutely. manifest. And it's so much fun. We should all spend more time imagining the world's. Yeah, I was with, like, I have a two-year-old, she turns three, and a lot of people are like, she looks just like you, she looks just like you, and, like, she'll do certain things where people remind them of me when I was younger, and mm. I can see a lot of it, and she's so imaginative, and she's so figuring things out on her own, and, like, that, I think that kind of shaped the mm. project, how I'm thinking about life, too. I left that out, but I think that's a really big part about it, and yeah, like, it's just, it's, it's interesting, because people say, follow your dreams, but it's like, there's no objective there sometimes right. versus like your imagination. Right. Like it's what kind of drives you to get stuff like out of your system. And I like that, that phrasing personally. Yeah. I like that too. I might switch over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a good one. that's a good one to push out there. Honestly. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. It's, it's like letting, it's letting your imagination fuel what your dreams become. Exactly. It's okay. as stuff and thoughts like, just creating space for all of the things that you don't pay attention to and for those to emerge. And as you cultivate them and follow them along, then you understand, oh, that's where I want to go. Exactly. Exactly. Definitely. Cool. I'm with it. That's the one we're going to have to push out there. <laughs> yeah. One totally. trademark. Let's make it free and open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> open source. Open source. <laughs> Fully decentralized. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with it. Cool. That seems like a good like piece of hope to you know to end on. I just have one more question for you, which I ask everybody at the end of these. Cool. You're going to a desert island. You get to bring three records with you. What are they? Man, one of my favorite bands, Puerto Rican reggae band, Cultura Profetica. Their Mota album, M O T A, huge influence on me. Love that project. Oh, another one. Let's see. This is this one's tough. I know, it's um, a hard question. Yeah, I, mean, I got a whole collection. and then like, Yeah, it's, it's an impossible I question. I make music and it's crazy. Man, yeah, it's a hard one. I'll take a hard drive, if anything. Oh, hard hard drives. They immediately <laughs> melt if they make it to the island. <laughs> Man, like, I'm thinking of a Kendrick one, but it's so hard to choose. Yeah, even taking just three of Kendrick's albums is hard enough. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, damn, man, I love damn. I think I would take damn with me. Kendrick Lamar, damn. Yeah, I'm think I'm trying to think of like a reggaeton one, but there's mm. <laughs> there's so many out there. Plus, I also follow a lot of like producers and songwriters that I like admire, look up to. Right. 
Man, two down, one to go. This is the hardest one, third one. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think of some stuff on Spotify. I'm about to open my Spotify or something. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Man, you know what, actually? Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> nice. Was a big influence on me when I was in engineering school. And I would use it as reference for all of my mixing and, you know, transitions and just mm. the world behind that. There's something about that album that sounds super epic. <laughs> yeah, it is super epic, that album. That's a good trio. I don't know, actually. I don't know Cultura Profetica, but I will check them out. Part of the reason I asked that question is so I have nice, awesome nice. new music to listen yeah. to. <laughs> incredible, yeah. They're incredible band. Cool, man. And then where's the best place for people listening to follow you or to get involved with what you're doing? Yeah, so definitely Twitter. It all starts there at Excellencia. <clears throat> you want to follow me on Instagram as well. And then, yeah, I think Twitter's the best place, to be honest, because that's where I dive in a lot more into mm. everything I'm into. <laughs> Instagram cool. is a lot lighter on, on that. <laughs> yeah, I guess depending on whether you want to stay light or really dive in. Twitter, <laughs> exactly. Twitter Instagram. If you want my bad takes, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, man. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for being here. And I really enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate it. Same here, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Take care. All right, that's it for this episode of Big Brother and the Hodling Company. I'm your host, McKeegan Voice, and you can keep up with me and all the latest Web3 music trends on Twitter at McKeegan. That's M-A-C-E-A-G-O-N. This show is a production of Decentral Media. And you can visit us at decentral.io. And remember, only you can prevent and fend off. Big Brother. <laughs>